Hi, I'm Mike from Craft Supplies USA, and today I'm going to show you how to turn a salt shaker. These are a really fun project that really don't require much. All you need is just a little rubber stopper and some scrap material, and you can turn a nice little set of shakers. I have a few different examples here. This is kind of a more traditional style. Um, I've got that one drilled out for salt, and then I have a nice matching pepper shaker with that one. Um, as far as my material goes, um, the nice thing about this project is it can be um, a lot of the time scrap material. Um, the piece I'm using today, this is just a 2x2x4 two by two by inch piece of cherry and it is dry. I want it to be fairly dry so that way um, if I, whenever I put salt in there it doesn't start to um, deteriorate or have any mold issues or anything like that. As well as I want the, the drilled hole in the bottom to remain round. I don't want it to warp on me at all. Um, but I think we're ready for the turning process. And again, I've got this as a 2x2x4, two by two by and we can go ahead and, and start turning this. The nice thing about these is it's really easy to do, and you can turn a bunch of these little sets fairly quickly. Um, but I'll show you some tips and tricks that I've learned after doing a few sets, and hopefully you'll learn something in the video. As far as material to avoid, I would stay away from the exotics. Um, anything that might be potentially allergic to people, um, stay away from. So that's why I went with a cherry. You could also use a beech, a maple, um, some of the fruit woods are okay to use as well, um, but the cherry looks nice and this will patina over time as well, which is kind of nice. So to start turning this, I'm going to mount this between centers and give myself a small tenon on one end that I can then flip around and mount in the chuck. So let's go ahead and put our four prong drive center. I'm going to mount that directly into the chuck. Make sure that's tight. Then we can bring up our revolving center, and I've already got little center points already punched in here, so I'm just going to line those up and get that centered and mounted. You don't need to get crazy with the tailstock tension, just snug is all we need for right now, and then give that a quick little spin by hand to make sure that that clears the tool rest. Need to drop that just a hair. Okay, once that clears, we can go ahead and start turning that. I'll be using my spindle roughing gouge to rough this to round, and I want to stop as soon as the piece is round. I don't want to go below um, a perfect circle here. I want to try and maintain as much of the, the material that we have. And then we're going to turn that tenon right there. So spindle roughing gouge handled down at my hips. I'm cutting on the lower wing here, and we're just going to ease that material off the wood. Whenever you're using that spindle roughing gouge as well, you want to cut downhill. So I kind of start in the middle, and then I bring it down to the end, then go back to the center, and then work that down towards the edge. We're almost to round right here, and now I'm going to roll that flute over and cut towards the chuck. Right here, I need to be very careful of my chuck jaws. Don't want to damage those. If I lay my tool on there, that's nice and round. I've got a couple flat spots. You can see it's kicking that tool up. And now we'll grab my skew and give ourselves a little bit of a ten and. I'm also going to bump up the speed slightly now that it's round. And then I'm also going to chamfer that tenon. The reason I put a tenon on this piece is I want to have a nice secure hold in my chuck because I will be turning it slightly unsupported as well as we're going to be drilling from um, the tailstock end. So I want as good and secure a hold as I can get. Whenever you mount a piece by just the corners, if it's, you know, a square piece in your chuck jaws, it's not as secure. So now we can go ahead and get rid of that four prong drive. And we can mount this in our chuck jaws. That dovetail is going to keep this piece nice and secure while we do all of our drilling and rough turning on the bottom here. So make sure that's nice and snug and tighten up both the pinion gears. And before we drill this end, I want to make sure this is nice and square. Forzner bits don't like um, crooked end pieces or else they'll, they'll try to skate on you. So I want to make sure this is nice and square. 
Looks like it's running pretty true, but we can do a cleanup pass. I'll take my spindle gouge here. This is a 3 8. Make sure my flute's closed. And just clean this end up a little bit. Okay, perfect. Now we can remove our revolving center. The perfect drill bit for this is a one inch hole. And because it has that nice little step there, it helps lock it into place, but we'll be using a one inch Forzner bit, which makes it nice and easy. All right, so I'll be using a keyless drill chuck. I'll make sure that's nice and seated. And then again, this is a one inch bit. Before I drill this, I wanna lay out how um, deep I need to drill here with the drill bit. And I'm gonna measure the one I've already turned. Okay, if I drill that three inches deep, that'll give me roughly a quarter inch of material here on the end. So that's gonna be perfect. One thing I can do is I can lay that out on my drill bit itself and then mark where three inches is. And that's gonna be my depth stop. I'm also just gonna mark it on the piece just so I know where the drill bit's gonna end. So right in there. Now we can turn the lathe on and we'll drop our speed down. We were turning at about 2000 RPM and now we're gonna drill this out at 800. Anywhere between six to 800 is good for Forstner bits. Obviously the larger the bit, you're gonna to wanna to slow that down a little bit more um, just due to the amount of um, friction and stress it puts on the wood. So bring this in and get that nice and close. Once your speed is set, your drill bit and everything's set and you know your depth, you can go ahead and start drilling. And usually on the entry cut, I slow down just a little bit and make sure that center point is right on center because otherwise it'll lead to an oversized hole or a slightly out around hole if it doesn't start right on center. Getting just a little bit of flex out of this bit. I think it's rather dull. A newer bit would be cutting a little bit cleaner, but I need to sharpen this one up sometime. And then just slowly advance this into the piece. You want to go slow enough that it can still clear the chips. Once you're in there a ways, you can back this out just a little bit to help clear the chips. As well as I just need to get a little more travel with the quill, so that's why I adjusted that back. Okay, we'll pull that out. You can see we're slightly off center a little bit. That's gonna be just fine. I'm gonna pull this all the way back and give myself the full travel with the quill. And then I'm just gonna pay attention to my pencil mark right here. Okay, I'm gonna move this out of the way and I'm just gonna double check with my pencil. Overall depth. Okay, we're about an eighth of an inch shy. The bit spun just a hair in my drill chuck. I need to drill it just a little bit deeper. All right, that's perfect. So now we can get rid of our revolving center and get that out of the way, and same with the tailstock. And from here, what I wanna do is I wanna have this be a slightly concave surface, so that way when it sits on the table, it registers on the outside rim. And then I wanna give myself a nice little step in there that way when the stopper's in place, the stopper is recessed and it doesn't contact the table so it sits flat. So we'll cut that nice little shoulder and the, and the undercut as well. And now we'll bump that speed back up. 
And to cut that small shoulder in here, I'm gonna be using my skew like a scraper. I'm gonna cut a 3 16 recess about uh, 3 8 3 16 wide as well. And then just do a couple cleanup passes just to make sure that's nice and crisp. No torn grain, and then I'm gonna chamfer that inside hole just a touch. The Forzner bit tears the fibers out on the inside quite a bit, so I just wanted to clean up that nice shoulder and get rid of any torn fibers or any fuzzy bits that might be sticking out. Now I need to cut that slight recess. There's a couple different ways you can do that. I can use my skew to scrape it. That'll give me a nice undercut. Or I can go to my spindle gouge and do a pass to the center. Um, the reason I prefer using my skew right here is when I use my spindle gouge, these inside fibers are unsupported and they roll over and you have a fuzzy line. Where doing a scrape like this cuts it clean and I don't have to worry about that. So do whatever you're comfortable with. That's perfect, got a clean surface, undercut. We've cut our shoulder in the bottom there. Now we can sand and finish this. Um, and this will be the last time that this surface is exposed, so that we want to do that sanding and finishing right now. Surface is pretty clean, so I'll start with 220, and then we'll go on to the 320 and 400. Yeah, I need to drop my speed slightly. We were at 2300, I'm going to drop that down to 13. 13 is still probably a little quick, but it'll work for what we need to, and then try and sand that little shoulder as best you can. Uh, one thing it might be worth doing too is you can sand the inside of that drill hole just a little bit because um, those fibers are pretty rough from the Forstner bit. Go into our 320. And then finally our 400. I'm gonna hit the bottom of this with some denatured alcohol to raise that grain slightly. And then I'll sand that again with 400. That'll help prevent any raised grain if I need to wash these down the line. Um, usually that's what that, what that ends up happening is you'll take these apart you know, once a year and just rinse them out and clean them and everything. And I don't wanna have it be fuzzy when I do that. So I'm gonna grab that 400 and just denib that surface a little bit, soften that up, get rid of any of that raised surface. That's perfect. If you want to, you can go onto the, the Merlon pads. Those will help refine that surface just a little bit more. And now we can go on to are scratch free. So I'm gonna bump that speed back up to our turning speed, 22, 2300 RPM. And then I'll get some scratch free on there and get that in that surface. Okay, and that's all we need to do. So clean surface. Uh, cherry is a really well cutting material, cuts very clean um, when you know what you're doing. Um, especially with sharp tools. It leaves a really great surface behind um, and has a really rich, warm, vibrant color to it. So now we can take this out of our chuck. We'll sit that down on the lathe bed for just a moment. Um, the next step we need is we need to turn ourselves a small little jam chuck. This is going to be used to mount our piece back on there. And because we are using a Forzner bit and we have a repeatable hole every time, you can turn yourself a nice little jam chuck that you can reuse over and over. Um, if I was gonna do a bunch of these, I'd get a small piece of nylon. Um, some of our nylon turning square pieces that you can use for turning your own fixtures. Um, that way it doesn't warp or change shape or size or anything. So that's a good option as well. That or some stabilized material. 
Um, but I've got this nice little piece of maple here. I'll use this to turn a jam chuck. And for this piece, actually I'll mount this in my four prong just like we did before. So. We'll mount this guy between centers. A lot of times, usually, you can just eyeball the center of a square and you'll be pretty close. That looks pretty good. Get my revolving center again. And we'll just mount this between centers and we'll turn a tenon that we can mount in the chuck. So bring up that revolving center. Make sure your tail stock's locked down. Quill's nice and snug. And then we'll set our tool rest height again. Spindle roughing gouge. Peel cut. I'm going to square up the end. I want a nice square shoulder for that dovetail. Nice full contact. And then one thing I like to do is I chamfer that on both of those edges. I don't like sharp corners on anything. Get rid of that four prong drive now. We'll throw that back in our tool panel. And that will be perfect. Anytime I'm using a waste block that I know I'll reuse down the line, I'll always get a Sharpie and mark my number four jaw. That way I can remount it in the same jaw and have it be nice and concentric every time, have it run true. So I'm gonna mark that. Turn the lathe back on, finish roughing this to round, and then we'll be turning that little spigot there that we can use as a jam chuck. I'm gonna be going, it's roughly um, one inch diameter by about an inch. You can go longer if you want for more support. Um, but whatever size of material you have, it should be fine. Get rid of some of that material there. Adjust my tool rest in a little bit closer. I'll be using a peel cut. Peel cut on side grain makes really short work of the material. And to size this, a quick way to do it is give yourself a nice little taper. And then you can get your blank with the drilled hole and just rest it up against there. And that'll leave a burnish mark and that's where I know it's touching the inside of that. And that'll be used as our gauge to get our right size. So I've got my small burnish line here. I'll highlight that so you can see exactly where it is. And right now I'm gonna make sure that tenon's tapered to where it gets bigger as it goes further back. That way if I screw up the fit on the end, I still have material to then turn down and I don't undersize my tenon. Also you want a square shoulder as well. All right, let's give this a test fit. The maple will slightly compress as well, so you want to take that into account. Okay, it's close. It's not slipping over that taper we have. It's very close though. So I'm going to bring that back in. Okay, it's close. You can hear it. Just trying to slip over that edge. 
We'll bring this down just a bit more. Okay, it's going on there about eighth of an inch or so. Okay, it's about halfway on the tenon. Uh, it's just getting a little bit too snug right here because I do have that taper, so at least I know it's fitting on the front half and it's a good fit on the front half. Now we just gotta turn the back part of this tenon down. We'll give this a shot. Okay, that's a really good fit. I think we still have just a little bit too much taper on the last eighth of an inch or so. There we go, that should be it. The nice thing about this is, is we'll be able to reuse this on, the, on subsequent shakers so you won't have to spend this time if you're doing a set. But you do want to take your time here because I do want to reuse this, so I want to make sure that I get a really good fit and it's not sloppy that I have to use paper towel or anything in there. So Now we can bring up our revolving center for support. Perfect. And as far as the fit goes, this is tight enough to where I can turn it without the revolving center, and that's what you're looking for because we will be turning the end of this and rounding this over with a tool and it's not going to be supported by the revolving center, so you do want to have your jam chuck to where it has a tight enough fit that it can keep that in place. If it gets too loose, then this thing will walk off the jam chuck and then it'll fly off the lathe on you. So we'll bring this up. Just for a little extra support right now, I'm going to turn the lathe back on. And actually before we turn this, I want to lay out where my transition lines are going to be and my overall length. Because I am trying to match this, I want these to be as close as possible to where you don't notice any difference in size or, or shape or anything. So to my first transition line right here is 3 quarters of an inch and the overall length is 3 and 3 eighths. So if you're wanting to turn this exact set, those are the measurements on the length. So we have three quarters of an inch for our transition line. That's where we're going to have the transition from the small taper to the big taper. And then we're three and three eighths on our overall length. And then we'll turn the lathe on and scribe those all the way around. And then this is the depth of our drilled hole. It's that three inches right there. So now what I want to do is I want to establish our diameters and then we can turn this thing to shape. Um, I'm going to grab my calipers and we're going to turn the end piece here first. Just going to get my calipers to the diameter the front end and set that and then I know it's a lot smaller than the material here so I'm going to rough it down and one thing you can do too that'll help is if you can just step this down be careful where that pencil line was so you don't erase it I just clipped my pencil line right here. I'm going to remark it. Grab my calipers and check the diameter. Okay, that's getting pretty close. About a sixteenth, maybe a thirty second left.
We mark that pencil line. Again, that's what we're going for. So, got that nice straight taper. Get my calipers in check. Okay, we're right about there. So, I'm going to leave that one alone because I need to account for some sanding and how much material we're going to lose with the sandpaper. Now, I want to establish the rear diameter. So, I'm going to get my calipers and just set that as well. I don't want to mess with that transition line just yet. We'll get our calipers and give it a nice little check here. Okay, we've got about a quarter inch to go. I'm going to remove some of that waste material as well because it's in the way. So we'll turn that down. And we should be getting close. Okay, so the calipers are just slipping over the taper right here. So that gives me a good eyeball of where we need to turn it down to. Stop the lathe and check it. Very close to slipping over. I did lose my pencil line there, so I'm going to redraw that. Again, that was three quarter of an inch. That's actually pretty close. Okay, we're still just a little bit large here on the end. I'm going to turn that down. Again, and I'm looking to match these up. One thing that can help too, a lot of times, is if you just lay those next to each other, you can see our overall length is just a tad long. I think I erased that pencil mark and we're gonna have to remove eighth of an inch. Um, our taper to transition looks great. That looks pretty good. Double check our calipers here. Still just a little proud on the end. And once we have the end established, the diameter, then we can establish our center diameter here. And we should have a nice, clean transition. Okay, the end of that blank is right on the calipers. It's just a, just a hair proud, but that'll sand out perfectly. So now I'll establish our center diameter at the transition line. and it's almost slipping over. So it's only gonna take a couple cuts and then we'll be just fine. Hey, okay, perfect. I just wanna verify my overall length one more time before I start rounding the end over. So we were three and three eighths. So once I line that up at the end, three and three eighths should be right there. So right about an eighth of an inch longer than I was needing it to be. And that'll give us a good amount of room there to get a nice clean radius, nice radius face on the end. I can put our calipers away now. And I'm gonna switch to my spindle gouge. That way I can start rolling this face over and getting rid of this excess material on the end. Okay, 
you use that spindle gouge. This one has a double bevel grind on it. The reason is I ground the heel away. That gives me more clearance to work in these tight spaces. That way I can utilize my revolving center for as long as possible. And we'll just start rolling that over. We want to be very careful here with our flute. Make sure that flute's completely closed before you start the cut because I don't want to have that skate up my finished surface here. Um, we've got our dimensions where we want them and I don't want to have to clean it, uh, some tear out or, or escape. And then I just want to match that radius I've got on this piece. Again, make sure that flute's closed before you start the cut. And then we'll just pare down that little piece of waste material. And right here, I want to be very, very careful. I don't want to snap that waste material off because it'll tear out those end grain fibers because we have a, a fairly thin wall right here, maybe an eighth of an inch or so. And if it breaks those fibers out, we're not going to have material left to turn it and clean that surface up. So we're going to make the break line a sixteenth or so away from the end of the finished surface. That way if the fibers do break, it's in a bit of scrap material and not on our finished surface. So I'm going to start paring this down. That way when it does break off, it'll break off on waste material and not our finished surface. So the nub's gone now. We have a fairly secure hold still. So I should be able to turn this without too much chatter. And you want to be fairly gentle here. You don't want to break these fibers off. We want to cut them cleanly. All right, I'm going to stand back and inspect that surface. It is just a little bit pointier than I want it to be. So I'm going to pick up the cut midway through. And just slowly remove some of that nub right in the center. Looks pretty good. I'm going to put those side by side and see. I think this bottom one's just a hair longer, so I'm going to remove maybe a 32nd of length off the end just to make sure they're perfectly the same. Again, close that flute. We should be able to cut that nice and clean. It's looking pretty good. I'll do one more pass. And this is end grain, so we want to cut that as clean as possible so we don't have to sand as much. And then I'm just going to clean up this surface and prep it for sanding. Because I shortened it and it is a taper, that means it got bigger as I removed material. So now I need to shrink this back down to what my uh, finish size needed to be. And that should be right there. Now let's hold this up. If I match those transition lines up, I'd say this one is just a hair still too long. I'm not sure where we went wrong in our measurements, but clearly, clearly it was just a little bit too long. Yeah, that's perfect. Just gonna clean this up one last pass. Cool thing with the spindle roughing gouges is if I roll that flute completely over and ride the bevel, then I get a nice little shear scrape. And that'll leave behind a really clean surface that we can then sand. Perfect. I think that is ready to sand. Now if I hold those two up, same height, diameter, everything matches. Now we can go ahead and sand. We'll drop that speed back down. 
I get rid of my tool rest. On a piece like this where I want to have these walls be nice and straight, I'm going to grab each end of my paper and then just put some tension on the paper to where it straightens it out and that'll help keep this surface nice and flat. I want to be careful when I sand up to that transition point, I want to keep that nice and crisp. I don't want to roll that over with the sandpaper. Now I'll sand the bottom half. Again, be careful with that transition line so that you don't roll it over. And if you do roll it over, you can always go back and make one more cut to, to you know, clean that up a little bit. Okay, those surfaces feel really good. Now I'm going to use my palm to sand the end here, as well as I want to keep this transition line nice and crisp as well, so I'm not going to roll that over. Okay, we're going to go on to our 320 now. Again, use your palm on the end there. That'll help you keep that nice curve you turned. Um, if you use your fingertips, it's uneven pressure and it doesn't lend to a nice smooth radius or profile on the end. Now we can go up to our 400. You know, this project is really fun just because everybody you know could use a set of shakers, especially a nice custom set, and it really doesn't take that much money to do these because a lot of this could be done out of scrap material and then this little piece is only, you know, a dollar or two. It's pretty pretty inexpensive project. Okay, now I'm going to get my denatured alcohol. I'm just going to saturate the piece. You see how it accentuates the nice natural cherry color. It makes it pop. Um, we're going to let that raise the grain for just a second. Let that alcohol flash off. And then we'll hit it again with that 400 grit to denib that surface. I can already feel I got a little bit rougher than what I had with the 400 before. I'm going to bump the speed up just a hair and then just lightly sand the surface again. Okay, perfect. Now I'm gonna go on to my scratch free. So I'll bump the speed back up to our turning speed to polish this. Um, the scratch free is food safe. That's why I'm using it on this project as well as it's easy to reapply when I'm using these, washing them, I can just throw another little top coat of wax to help protect that surface over time. All right, let's stop and take a look, inspect the surface, see if there's any torn grain we missed or any flaws in the surface. So the end looks nice and clean, surface is looking really great. Um, our transition lines are nice and crisp still. All right, so the next step in the process is gonna be drilling the holes for the pepper to come out. Um, for mine, I prefer an eighth inch diameter hole with five pattern for the pepper. And then for my salt, I'll do a 330 seconds with three of those. So the very first one I'll drill on the lathe because that'll help us keep the very first hole centered. And I'll show you a couple tips and tricks I've learned as far as marking these out. All right, so I've got my eighth inch drill bit mounted in my drill chuck. Make sure that's seated nice and square. And I'll bring that up and we'll drill the very first center hole and then we can mark the other holes for the hole pattern because we'll drill those off the lathe. Drop your speed down to 1200 or so or less. And you want to go slow. These really small bits are really prone to flexing and going off center especially on a surface that's rounded over. So the very first hole, we're gonna slow down, let that bit register on center before we go in too far. And there, we, there we go, once we're in, then we can finish drilling through. So that gives us a good clean center hole. And now what we can do is we'll bring up our tool rest and use this as a straight edge to mark the hole pattern for the other four holes and keep those nice and even. I'm gonna give myself a rough line on the exterior, just a circle. That's the line where the, cent the bits are all gonna be centered. And then we can turn this off. We'll lock the spindle. And then we'll scribe. Our lines across.
Okay, we'll unlock the lathe, rotate that 90 degrees. And if you don't have an indexing point, just keep that nice and square. And then because you're putting such a little amount of pressure on this, it shouldn't spin on you. I'm going to scribe that exter exterior circle just a little bit better. It didn't get a very good line. Okay. All right, so I've taken the piece in the chuck off of the lathe. The uh, reason I kept it on the waste block in the chuck is it gives me something more stable to hold the piece as I drill it. And we're going to be remounting this to just sand and finish the end once the holes are drilled to soften up any of those sharp edges where the holes are drilled. So we're going to keep that in place. Uh, we've got our outlines of where we want our four other holes to go. And the next step is using a center punch. Um, depending on the bit you use, if you're not using a brad point, make sure you center punch these before you try and drill them. Um, regular twist bits will usually skate around on the surface and it'll ruin all that surface you've already turned. So I'm going to use this Forsner bit. It has a really sharp center point. And I'm going to use that to give me a starting point for the holes I'm drilling. And it'll help keep that bit nice and centered up. I think the five hole pattern looks very traditional, looks really nice. Um, depending on what you're going to fill it with and the coarseness of your salt or pepper, you might need to change your hole size accordingly. So now that we have our center points marked, we can use our bit. And it sometimes helps to bring up your tool rest. And I can kind of use that as a support when I drill as well. So I'm going to make sure my bit's on center. Well, you can see it skated on me. That is not what I want to have happen. That's not ideal. The bit did skate on me. Um, I will have to sand and, and refinish that surface right there where it skated. And that's what we were trying to avoid. But I'll show you how to clean that up here in just a moment. I'm going to go back through and just clean these up a little bit. All right, now we're going to throw this back on the lathe. Um, because we drilled this surface, there's rough edges around each of the holes, so we're going to put this back on the lathe and just hit it with our 400 grit sandpaper and then our scratch free again. All right, we're going to go to our 400 grit and just lightly sand the surface. Just knock down any of that raised edge from the drilled holes there. And we can grab a little bit more scratch free. Just to clean up that surface. And I'll put one more coat on the outside. Just clean off any dust we had as well. So now we can stop the lathe. Remove our shaker. There we go. Got a really good fit on our jam chuck. Just shake out any dust we have there. Um, but that is ready to go. The one last thing I would do before I use this is I'd get an air compressor and just blow out any dust from drilling and turning on the inside. And then blow out any dust or debris you have inside the drill holes. There's a little bit of scratch free and some wax in there. Um, but if I sit these up here, mash these two up, the length, the height looks really great. The only downside is on this one, I did have that skate, so there's a little bit of a nick, and it's not right on the, the, the mark I center punched. The bit did skate on me, so that's a little bit of a downside on that piece. Um, but these two together should make a nice little set. Once you've blown this out and you're ready to put your stuff inside, you can then can use your rubber stopper. This piece, I'll usually just put the first edge in 
and then because it's nice and pliable you just squeeze that into place and what I like to do as well is I'll grab my chuck key or just something with a point and just push that all the way down in there and make sure that sits nice and flat and then your shaker is ready to go again these little salt and pepper shakers are a really fun project and these make really great gifts once someone sees a custom set of these they're gonna want one from you um, and they move pretty good at craft shows as well um, the biggest thing with them is they're really cheap fairly quick to do and they don't require really expensive wood to do it as well so if you have any questions or anything uh, that we didn't address in the video, go ahead and leave a comment or you can send an email to questions at woodturnerscatalog.com. I look forward to hearing from you guys and stay tuned for the next video.